Good morning, everybody. Beautiful sunny morning. Let's hope we have more like that to come. This is our popular web show, It's All in Your Head. And today I'm here with Dr. Rick Bradshaw, and we will be discussing treating the effects of traumatic emotional stress. Dr. Bradshaw has a lot of knowledge in this field. In fact, he has over 30 years of experience as a psychologist and counselor treating psychological trauma. He completed his PhD at Michigan State University and postdoctoral residency in the psychology department of the WCB. He has taught graduate students in counseling and clinical psychology at three post-secondary institutions and supervised many theses and research projects on psychological trauma. He is currently working full-time at Swingle Clinic as clinical manager, and his specialty is treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder and dissociative disorders in adults. Okay, before we get started, I'd like to say that we will have two breaks so that we can answer your questions. Don't hesitate to send your questions at any time during this web show. Simply type your question in the chat box, which opens up when you click on the chat tab on the control panel and click send. And now, without further ado, let me welcome Dr. Rick Bradshaw. Good morning. Good morning, and I'd like to start by just giving you an overview of what we're going to be covering. I'll be talking fairly quickly, but we will be posting this on the website within about 10 days or less, so you'll be able to go back over it and hear it and, and see the PowerPoint slides and review it. Um, first, we'll be talking about what are the effects of traumatic stress. Then we'll be going into a review of two therapies for traumatic emotional stress that are used in the uh, Swingle Clinic. And then finally, we'll be looking at resources that you can purchase or training that you can attend if to uh, learn some of these therapies. So first of all, we just want to define what is psychological trauma. It's the subjective internal experience of an event as negative, unexpected, overwhelming, making one feel confused and powerless. So. That's different than the external objective definition, which is just um, a, an event occurs that everyone would agree is traumatic. Because if you think of a very young child from birth to five years old, it doesn't take very much to overwhelm their abilities to cope. And that's where a lot of trauma occurs that um, has the effects that go through the rest of the life for adults. So for about a third of people, who have major severe psychological trauma, they experience what's called acute stress disorder. So what that includes is at least three dissociative symptoms. Dissociation is a separation internally in some way or a numbing out. So the first one would be depersonalization. That's where some part of the person doesn't feel real, doesn't feel connected to themselves, like looking in the mirror, not recognizing themselves, that sort of thing. Another symptom of dissociation is derealization, where the world around you feels like you're in a fog or like it's not real, like you're in a movie, that kind of thing. Another one is amnesia, where you don't remember part or all of the event. Another one is just a dazed kind of state. And finally, sort of an emotional numbing, detached unresponsiveness, which is so common among the veterans coming back uh, and what their spouses complain about. They're emotionally disconnected, not able to respond emotionally in relationships. Then you have at least one intrusive symptom. And those would be the hallmarks of PTSD kinds of symptoms like uh, flashbacks, nightmares, that sort of thing. Then at least one hyperarousal symptom which can include sleep disruption, anxiety, shaking, um, and irritability. It's a hyperarousal symptom that's quite often overlooked because when someone is hyperaroused, they're overreactive to tiny symptoms or tiny uh, stimuli in their environments. Another one is the at least one avoidance symptom, and that would be numbing of various kinds, uh, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. Then if that acute stress disorder persists for at least a month, it usually qualifies for post-traumatic stress disorder, which includes three clusters of symptoms. As I mentioned earlier, one of the classic hyperarousal responses for PTSD is startle response, so the exaggerated startle. So every time someone comes around the corner or speaks when someone isn't expected, um, also sleep problems in addition to irritability. As I mentioned earlier, the intrusion can include fragmented experiences, body memories that come out of nowhere, 
that don't seem related to an event, emotions that pop out unexpectedly, um, that kind of thing, in addition to the usual flashbacks and nightmares. Numbing and avoidance can include dissociation, and that sometimes manifests as poor concentration. That's one of the first things people will complain about after a trauma is they can't seem to concentrate when they go back to work or in their families. Sometimes blocked thoughts and emotions, sometimes somatoform dissociation where they actually don't feel some kind of physical symptom or awareness in their body. Um, then we have how often does PTSD occur? So. Lifetime prevalence of PTSD in North American population is about 8%. Women are about twice as likely as men to have PTSD, about 10% compared to 5% of men. And that certainly doesn't mean women are weaker or more vulnerable. It, it means they've experienced some of the kinds of traumas that more likely result in PTSD, which is more interpersonal trauma, like domestic violence, sexual assault, sexual abuse. Um, those kinds of events result in PTSD about 50% of the time, whereas, for example, motor vehicle accidents, even the fairly severe ones, only result in PTSD about 2.6% of the time. And sexual violence is a greater risk factor for PTSD than physical violence. Then if we look at dissociation, many people don't recognize or understand dissociation. In some ways, it's a more severe and debilitating uh, symptom of trauma than some of the sorts of things we associate with regular PTSD because it affects the ability to connect with others and connect with one's own feelings. So um, the estimate of experts in the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation estimate that about 20% of the general population has enough uh, dissociation, clinically significant dissociation, to warrant treatment. That's a pretty big chunk of the population, one in five. Finally, you think, well, what about healthy people like undergraduate students at university? They must be doing pretty well, and they must not have these kinds of experiences. But I remember reading one study where it noted that about 12% of undergrad psychology students dissociatively self-abuse. So pretty common stuff. We look a little further now at the symptoms of PTSD, just where are they manifesting in the body and the brain and what kinds of things are going on. So the hyperarousal cluster, they found that the right hemisphere of most people is more associated with adrenaline arousal. So when someone's triggered into a trauma, the right hemisphere of their brain is lighting up a lot more in terms of regional cerebral blood flow and things like that. Also includes those agitated depressive states and the kind of signatures with EEG that are manifest there would be higher alpha, which is a slow wave. It's a hypo activation on the anterior, in other words, the frontal left dorsolateral, so the, the front left side surface of the brain, and also higher beta on the right before therapy, which can burst at neurotherapy, and we can do that here in the clinic. Another set of PTSD symptoms, reduced volume and blood flow in the hippocampal dentate complex, which is the memory processor. So memories are out of context. They're experienced as more present tense, immediate danger, and fragmented. We also have excessive activity in the anterior cingulate cortex, which is kind of the brain's early warning system. So people get confused about how immediate and severe a threat is, and there can be constant worry and racing thoughts, and we also treat that here in the clinic with neurotherapy. Here's what the anterior cingulate looks like. It's not on the cortex on the surface of the brain, and it's not down in the in-between. And the anterior cingulate, when it's activated, has been linked with both physical and emotional pain. So in other words, if someone has a really nasty breakup or divorce, that can be lit up as much as if someone was being physically hurt. Really interesting set of results from a Canadian researcher named Ruth Lanius. She, she had people who had been sexually abused uh, and she had them triggered into their traumas with short little 50-second audio tapes, she found that about 70% of them went into what's called ab reaction, which is intensity. So their, breathe, their uh, respiration rates went up, their blood flow and volume went up, those kinds of things. Um, they were triggered and showed the usual kinds of symptoms of trauma. And she found about 30% went into a dissociative state, so slowed heart rate, slowed breathing, that sort of thing. So 
Uh, that's something very important to consider. We're going to be talking a little more about that, what kinds of people have a little more of the dissociation. Usually people who have more childhood trauma will tend to go into a dissociative reaction. There was a really good study she did where a man uh, who had very little childhood trauma was in the same car accident with his wife who had a lot of childhood trauma. So they triggered up the same accident with these little audio scripts, and the man's brain went into a very hyperactivated kind of state, and all kinds of things were going on, and the woman's brain almost looked like she was shut down or going to sleep. Because of the nature of the childhood trauma, it had set up a pattern where she had to dissociate to survive. Here's that little area we talked about, the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, known as Broca's area, which is the speech production area. So when someone's triggered into a trauma or experiences a severe trauma, their, their speech is inhibited. So what that can create is a speechless terror. That's a really important one to keep in mind for people who have been assaulted, especially sexually assaulted, because people will say, well, why didn't you yell out, or why didn't you talk to them, or why didn't you push them off, those kinds of things. So that is often the reason why, because their own brain went into the state where it was difficult to generate speech. Really important to recognize that a lot of these really intense symptoms, like you know, nausea and panic attacks and those sorts of things, emanate from the deeper brain, what's called the limbic system in the midbrain. They get a lot more amygdaloid arousal. The amygdala is kind of the emotional processor and starts the whole chain of adrenaline in the body. So we have to look at, in addition to the usual PTSD kinds of symptoms, what other kinds of things happen to people who have severe psychological trauma. Well, about 80% of people with PTSD also have, in other words, they all, they have, they're comorbid with other Axis one diagnoses in this. Um, we have about, depression is in, uh, present about 50% of the time. Anxiety, different kinds of anxiety can get layered in there. You can have generalized anxiety, you can have panic attacks, you can have phobias that start to develop, you can have complex PTSD and borderline personality disorder. In addition, you can get major dissociative disorders, one of the most serious of which is dissociative identity disorder, or what used to be called multiple personality disorder. Then you can get somatization where things go into the body. People can get things that look like epileptic seizures, but they actually aren't. Then you, people can get paresthesias, where areas of their body get numb, or they can get chronic pain in their back, hip, that sort of thing, often in areas of their body that were associated with the original trauma. We saw that in a trauma study that we did with women who had been sexually assaulted, and those things were able to be restored with good therapy. Also, addictions are very common comorbid factors with trauma, drug and alcohol abuse and dependence, eating disorders, different behavioral addictions like gambling and internet pornography and that sort of thing, also self-harming behaviors. So you say, what about how often do those things happen? Well, look at these, look at the prevalence here of uh, alcohol uh, abuse and addiction and drug addiction here for men and women and also panic disorder and agoraphobia, which is fear of the marketplace, like shopping malls and that sort of thing. Another really big factor is suicidality. So when people have a lot of adverse childhood experiences, different types of abuse or neglect or hospitalization or witnessing violence in the home, about seven or more of those, they have about a 31 times greater likelihood of attempting suicide than not. Very important factor to consider. And so many people overlook that. A really important uh, a set of studies and theories that's come out recently has been a thing called polyvagal theory by Stephen Porges. Um, this is important not only to understand that it's happening, but it's important to understand that you need a therapy that addresses all three levels of this problem. So usually when people have a trauma, they start by trying to do social connection. They start by saying, let's say a child is being abused. They say, um, please, daddy, stop doing this. Stop. It's hurting me. That sort of thing. They try a social connection. If that doesn't work, they try a fight or flight. They try to get away or they try to... Um, fight back, and then if they're too young or too little or not able to, to do that, then their body will automatically go into a freeze or submit um, response, which is almost a feigned death 
So their whole body starts to shut down the breathing rate and respiration rate and that sort of thing. And that's some of the stuff we see in those dissociative things we talked about earlier. So um, neurophysiologically, that's going on in the, the vagal nerve, the vagal nerve complex in the first two, and the dorsal vagal, which is the, the back, uh, toward the back of the vasal complex. We'll take a look at some of those kinds of responses a bit later. Babette Rothschild has also talked about coactivation. So sometimes both the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight in this, and the parasympathetic, which can be a kind of a numbing, are. Okay, shut we are going to, I'm going to take a, a little break, Dr. Bradshaw, because I hear you are uh, breaking out a little bit. So I'm going to check your um, microphone if everything is okay. If everyone can just hold on for one second, we'll, we'll, we'll um, go on very shortly. I'll just check what's going on. Okay, let's give it a try. Okay, so we're just finishing that bit about um, Rothschild's coactivation, which is sometimes called tonic immobility. It's where someone gets frozen physically. So sometimes when someone is almost completely lacking in movement, they can't move, you've still got a bunch of really high intensity states going on. And the way they've seen and measured that is these people, their pupil widths change in back and forth rapidly. And sometimes their um, blood pressure uh, or, or uh, their pulse rates change from 60 to 70 beats per minute to 110 to 120 beats a minute very quickly. So What's important to recognize about this is about half of childhood sexual abuse victims get some of those symptoms. 35 to 40 percent of sexual assault victims get quite a lot of that. And 10 or 10 to 12 percent report extreme immobility. In other words, they can't move. They're frozen. And that's the kind of thing that happens sometimes with sexual assault. And again, someone will say, well, why didn't you push away? Why didn't you run? Why didn't you try to get away? And they can't remember. They don't understand why. It's because their body went into that dorsal vagal response and froze. So they couldn't move. And a lot of times that's accompanied by opioid-mediated analgesia. In other words, the body's own painkillers kick in and the person doesn't feel any pain until much later. Let's take another look at another quick and important uh, factor to keep in mind with trauma. So with PTSD and various types of trauma response, people get more situationally access memories, things that are involuntary incoherent, disorganized kinds of narratives. So there, when someone says, tell me what happened, what happened next, who did what, where were you, their, their narratives when they're doing police reports and things are all incoherent and disorganized. Sometimes they also have fragmented somatic and emotional responses. They sometimes, like we talked about, get panic attacks, flashbacks, experience sense of helplessness and shame and that sort of thing. Whereas without trauma, you get more of the voluntary coherence. Someone can be clearly telling the whole story and it's all organized. And definitely, people who've had severe traumas have experienced this. They don't understand why. They don't understand why they couldn't just keep these nice coherent explanations for other people. So I think we, are we going to stop for another question period at this point? Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. We are going to take first break right now. We have accumulated some questions from the participants. Um, also, please send me a message if uh, Dr. Bradshaw's microphone improved. I'm still getting a little bit of breaking up, but I'd like to get some feedback from uh, uh, some of you. So if you can just let me know how you are hearing Dr. Bradshaw, that would be fantastic. Um, am I breaking up on your side or is my no. microphone OK? Yeah, OK. OK, so first question. I've heard about people trauma resilient, including children who don't seem to be affected as much by traumas. Have you seen clients like that? Yeah, I think that's a uh, that's something I hear in the media, and it kind of drives me nuts because it's almost implying that there's these resilient people or resilient children that aren't really affected by trauma. And often, what it really is is dissociation. They've split off the part of them that was so wounded and traumatized by the event from the part that gets the job done or goes to school and things. I remember reading a case where there was a little girl in Brussels, Belgium, who had been severely uh, abused while she was abducted and they kept saying that she was going to school. She had her little school uniform on, she was performing at school, didn't act unusually scared or anxious or sad and yet she was going home and being severely abused because she had split off. So I would just say be really careful about that kind of idea that some people are just resilient. Another factor in that is that some people have more earlier trauma. It's almost like being burned, like a third degree burn on your skin or something and then if someone hits someone 
who's had a third degree burn in the same place, they're going to feel it a lot more and be a lot more affected than someone who has not had that kind of response. So I would just say that's a, that's a woundedness or a hypersensitivity based on prior trauma rather than that person's weak. Thank you. Another question. My husband has been drinking for 30 years and going to AA off and on. I worry that if he goes into treatment and starts talking about emotional stress and trauma, he might just use that as an excuse. What do you think? Well, I, I would tend to think the opposite because I've seen a lot of addiction programs, unfortunately, that don't address the underlying trauma. So what it kind of creates is the revolving door in these trauma treatment centers where people go out, get the, the alcoholism or drug treatment. The traumas underlying those states aren't addressed either with neurotherapy or psychotherapy, and then they come back and then they feel like failures because they can't get rid of it. They've got an underlying brain state that hasn't been alleviated, which drives them into finding some kind of relief. That's also why you get some people who are able to stop the drinking or the drugs, but then they get all kinds of other behaviors that have the same characteristics, like they go into uh, using internet pornography, they go into work addiction, that sort of thing. I've heard people say that alcoholism is self-medication for trauma. What do you think about that? Yeah, I totally agree, because I think it reduces the person's um, activation in those areas of the brain that are causing them distress. What's happening, and we see this, we'll talk about this in just a minute, some brain states in addictions. So those create sort of an agitated depressive state that doesn't go away until something either distracts them or something changes chemically to reduce that state temporarily. So yeah, it definitely happens and I think it's an important factor to consider in addictions treatment. And we'll take one last question. The rest we'll go over during our second break. Is it possible to have both regular stress and PTSD? Yeah, the, the neuroendocrinology of major depression is very similar to a standard stress response. And such depressive disorders are comorbid with PTSD, as I mentioned earlier, about 50% of the time. So it's totally possible to have, quote, regular stress and, and full PTSD. Thank you. Okay, so I think we'll continue along. Um, we're looking now at some of the neurotherapy applications to traumatic stress, traumatic emotional stress. So first of all, we look at some of the kinds of signatures that have been found by Dr. Paul Swingle um, in his research with Vietnam veterans and other kinds of people in, our, in, in his clinic for many years. Um, first, we see a low theta-beta ratio. Theta is a daydreaming state. Beta in the back is kind of a focused, alert sort of state. And you don't want much of the beta compared to the theta. You want a ratio of about two to one of theta to beta in the occipital, which is the very back of the brain region. Um, another signature is high beta gamma to beta ratio over the anterior cingulate. We talked about the anterior cingulate earlier as being the early warning system of the brain. So if you get too much of this very fast wave to the beta concentration wave going on, it creates a fretting and a, almost an OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder pattern. You also see sometimes alpha suppression, um, which is when your eyes are open and then they go closed, there isn't a good solid response. 30% over the central cortex and 50% in the back. And finally, you get asymmetries in the parietal region, so left to right asymmetries, differences of more than 15% in the parietal region and the frontals. So here are the areas in the scalp that we look at for what's called the clinical cue, which Dr. Swingle um, created. So we look at the frontals, F3, which is the left, and F4. We look at the anterior cingulate, which is FZ, which is F center, CZ, which is the center of the sensory motor strip that runs across, and then we get O1, which is the occipital cortex on the left. If someone's had head injury, dementia, epilepsy, or psychosis, we'll do a full cap, and that's where 19 points get um, introduced into the computer and produces a much more detailed and comprehensive assessment of the scalp. So what we do in the clinic, we identify the brain signatures that I talked about earlier using this assessment called the clinical cue, 
with electroencephalography. Then we also address comorbid addictions, ADD or ADHD and depression, and then we address somatic and dissociative symptoms. In the clinic here, we not only do neurotherapy, but we do um, EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. We do OEI, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. We sometimes do hypnosis. We do somatoemotional release and craniosacral therapy. So quite a lot going on to address some of these comorbid conditions as they occur. The neurotherapy includes both operant conditioning with things like reward tones and lights, and also classical conditioning, which would be brain driving, which involves glasses that have lights that flash at certain frequencies, and CDs or sound samples that have harmonics embedded in them. Those were all developed by Dr. Paul Swingle over many years. So let's look at OEI which is observed and experiential integration combined with neurotherapy. So Dr. Swingle developed a trauma release protocol for neurotherapy. It's a push grab, so it pushes the brain up into alpha state, grabs and holds it there. The alpha waves, when they're released, also will often bring up trauma and release it. So as we see the trauma coming to the surface and releasing, we can see that on the computer screen when someone's hooked up. Um, then we'll do another therapy sometimes like observed and experiential integration. So if, it, if the neurotherapy gets stuck or stalled and the alpha isn't releasing, we'll sometimes do that. And all clinicians in the Swingo Clinic are certified in observed and experiential integration. So what is OEI? It's a series of five sets of techniques. The switch, which is just alternately covering the left and right eyes. There's glitch massage. Glitches are just little um, blinks or skips or holes or hesitations in the eye movement, and we track for those and then massage them by different, using different um, hand movements or face movements that the client watches. And then we do sometimes sweeping to get rid of some of those dissociative side effects like drowsiness, dizziness, um, visual uh, difficulties like blurred vision, those kinds of things. And we'll just guide the eyes across from, say, about the level of the ear to the nose, and then repeat that on the other side. Release points are places that we've discovered you can hold the eyes at a position of the lowest rib to reduce panic symptoms. So people can be shown those, and then they can take those home and use them to prevent panic attacks as they occur. Finally, we do attract a target, which is looking at a felt sense, an emotional or physical sensation, say, where is that the worst as we come across your eyes? And we find those places and massage those out to get rid of them. And sometimes cognitions or inner voices that are really critical, we can push those back um, to the point where they're not bothersome to the person. Glitch hold is just tracking into those intense little places and then having the client do bilateral stimulation, usually just tapping one shoulder and tapping the other. So why is it called observed and experiential integration? Well, the therapist is observing these tiny little glitches and things. And they're also watching for conflict and intensity markers, which are little things like reddening around the eyes, facial flush, um, a hold on breathing, um, sometimes visual splitting where one eye will go in one direction, one on the eye in the other. And the client is reporting what they're experiencing. They're giving the therapist cues, like right there is where that's the most intense, or right there that voice gets the loudest or the most disturbing um, or the most believable in my head. Client also notices and reports artifacts like headaches and things that happen during the process and the level of intensity. Then what do we mean by integration? Well, sometimes it's equalization, the intensity of a stimulus, the color, the light, the body tension level that goes with it. Sometimes we're combining emotions. Sometimes they're mad with one eye covered, sad with the other, and we can blend or dissolve those two. Sometimes there's a sensory uh, change. Double vision can clear. Physical pains can resolve. And finally, you've got disillusion of visual distortions, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So one of the things to recognize is that both eyes have connections to both halves of the brain. So each eye has a connection that goes to the same side of the brain and a connection that runs to the opposite side back in the sensory process or the thalamus, which then goes back to the occipital cortex. So we take a look at these symptoms. What is the switch 
used for. It's used for that a transference checking. Transference is where someone has had a really bad experience with someone in the past, a parent or an abuser or something like that, and then they transfer it onto something else, either the therapist or their spouse or their children. And sometimes we can even extend that into mirror work where someone has a body image distortion, like with eating disorders. We can also use it for bringing down the intensity of, of uh, trauma symptoms very quickly, and we can use it for clearing artifacts like headaches, things that are side effects. So we'll just take a look at a couple of slides of a study we did just in this clinic. We had someone who had quite a, a major transference reaction with her left eye open when she looked at a certain picture, a certain person. So the, to the point where the face was very distorted. So prior to OEI, what we had activated was the hippocampal dentate complex, which is shown right here on this slide. And that's associated with trauma memory. So something that was fairly, probably fairly early in time in the person's experience. After 90 minutes of OEI, it shifted to the right inferior temporal cortex, which is associated with just current facial recognition. They say, oh, I recognize that face. So some major changes can occur with some of these therapies. Sweeping, as I mentioned, clears those side effects. The release points can include a release for breathing where someone's chest gets really tight and they can't breathe, or the throat constriction, or they feel nauseated, or their jaw is really tense. So we have places we can touch where we release those. And glitch massage, as I mentioned, is used for all of these. That's where the therapist is guiding the client's eyes in different directions. And then glitch hold is where the therapist moves the client's eyes into a place where one of those little intensity points is observed, and then the client starts doing tapping back and forth. So we have another, sen another set of questions now, I think. Yes, we do. Okay. My daughter went through a lot of abuse from age one to three. We have not established PTSD, but I have always suspected. Is there a particular appearance of series of problems that she would exhibit? I think really young children will sometimes go into sort of dazed looking states um, where they don't respond. I mean, obviously all children have some times like that if they're particularly tired, but this is kind of a fairly sudden onset kind of experience. Um, sometimes they'll be extremely reactive unexpectedly to certain kinds of circumstances, like certain people's faces, certain sounds, certain smells. Um, sometimes that's an indicator. Um, I think it's really good to just be aware of the kinds of things in the same way that a parent can sometimes identify if the child is physically ill just by knowing their typical response patterns. They can sometimes recognize that even before a, a physician might just because they know so well what that child's typical patterns are. So just watch for those um, extreme reactions or more intense reactions. They can be both numbing or they can be reactive, where they're crying or shaking or um, afraid of certain people or situations um, more than you would expect. I have heard of EMDR, but not OEI. How is OEI the same or different from EMDR? Well, EMDR has a heavy emphasis on cognition, so they have someone come up with a belief about themselves in the event, and then they rate it on a scale of believability and intensity. Whereas with OEI, we found over the years that even though cognitions or thoughts or beliefs are certainly important, they actually change fairly, uh, fairly naturally if you can pull down the intensity under them. So in OEI, we spend a lot more time just engaging in pulling down the physical and emotional intensity associated with the event and less with the cognitions. Um, another thing is with EMDR, you can do EMDR even if someone's blind because you can use physical tapping or audio tones, whereas with OEI, you have to be able to track movement across and you have to be able to perceive light switching back and forth. Can the death of a loved one give rise to this trauma? Certainly, if it's especially if it's sudden. And I, I've, I used to work doing cases for um, life insurance companies where someone would have not only had a spouse or family member die, but they died in a very intense and unexpected way, say a car crash 
or a sudden heart attack, something that if someone's gradually dying and they're in their 60s or that sort of thing and they have time and they know what's going to happen, they're prepared for it, it's less likely to result in some of these traumatic symptoms. It's when it's negative and unexpected that it becomes traumatic. I think my stress is more general. I feel, I just feel really anxious around people at social events and I have self-esteem problems. Would these therapies help with that? Yeah, certainly you can get sub, um, sub-threshold symptoms of, that are like PTSD, some of the same symptoms of intensity and hyperarousal and anxiety. And we do see people with that quite a bit in the clinic where they just have a general anxiety being around people or an anticipatory anxiety associated with public speaking, those kinds of things. So definitely those exist and they can be treated with some of these same therapies. Okay, and we'll take one last question. How young children can be for these therapies? Um, we've used OEI with children as young as two and a half years where they'll even sit on the parent's lap while the therapy is occurring um, and get some good results with that. Neurotherapy, we've had some kids and they come in and they sit in a little high chair and um, just because they have trouble attending to a computer screen and something like that, we have a little bear. It's a, like a teddy bear that vibrates when their brains are doing the right thing. So it's quite a profound way of working with very young children as possible. Good. So we say, how and why does OEI work? Well, I have an article, if you want to read, I referenced an article in just a minute. Um, the, the complex one is the activation of pontogeniculo occipital waves, which I'm going to ask you to say quickly three times uh, with bilateral stimulation. Kidding, kidding. Um, we won't go into that. If you want to read more about that, you can go to the article I referenced. Um, ocular proprioception is another big one. I'm just going to explain what that is. So proprioceptive receptors are nerve cells in the muscles that send signals to the brain about muscle positioning. So those exist in large numbers and high densities in the six extraocular muscles. In other words, the muscles are on the outside that move the, the eyeballs themselves and control the movements of each eye and in the muscles of the neck. There's also intraocular muscles that control the curvature and thickness of the lenses for accommodation to distance and constriction and dilation of the pupils. Um, and those cells fire in response to eye movements in specific directions while tracking objects. So when someone's encountering a severe trauma, the brain is taking a very detailed multi-sensory video of everything that's going on in all the senses and in those muscles in the body. So what we see happening with OEI is when someone brings up a certain traumatic incident or an emotional or somatic state that's very intense, often those will load up or reload in the eyes. You can see these little glitches. We guide the eyes through various distances from the face and moving toward the person or away from the person in different angles, whether it's a curved movement or a straight movement or it's one direction, left, right, up, down. The differences seem to result in these releases of intensity. So that's one of the mechanisms that we think is active in some of the OEI techniques. Like I said, if you want to read more about this, there's 68 pages of pure joy in this article that you can read. It goes into a little bit of the neurobiology, some case examples, how the therapy was developed, where it came from, how it fits with other therapies, that sort of thing. So really important to recognize that there are a number of resources that we have for you in the clinic, one of which is written by Dr. Paul Swingle, the founder of this clinic. Um, Biofeedback for the Brain, How Neurotherapy Effectively Treats Depression, ADHD, Autism, and More. So I know the first time I read it, I was really impressed with the way it not only is comprehensive to the tune of, you know, to the tune where a clinician can almost get a protocol from it, but it's also readable for the average person where you can say, here's a bunch of cases that are similar to my child or my circumstance, and what do you do with it? What kinds of things do you do? So you can index in the back and look for certain symptoms or disorders, and then it'll lead you into parts of the book, and you can read about how neurotherapy can effectively treat those areas. Really important book for clinicians, those clinicians listening in, is Dr. Swingle's Basic Neurotherapy, the Clinician's Guide, and that goes through that clinical cue assessment that we've talked about through this uh, presentation. It goes through each one of the indicators or what we call signatures and what kinds of treatments 
are used in the clinic to engage those symptoms. <coughs> and then finally, we have a series of workshops coming up for professionals where you can be trained in clinical cue and brain driving. So there are two workshops coming up next month, October 19th to 21st, and that's fundamental neurotherapy, so the basics of neurotherapy with the clinical cue, and then advanced neurotherapy. So you may say, well, how would I qualify? For example, nurses can qualify. Um, people with health professional designations can qualify. So counselors, physicians, registered clinical counselors, uh, psychologists, uh, registered clinical social workers, those kinds of individuals would qualify to take that training. If you're in doubt, you can always inquire and send an email to Rita at swingleandassociates.com. So Rita, do you want to finish off any other thoughts before we finish today? Um, I would just say we only have two spots left for the uh, fundamental neurotherapy um, workshop. So if uh, anyone who is listening is interested, um, send me email right away. And uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's about it for today. Um, we are going to be back on October 13th, and uh, Dr. Swingle will be talking about maintaining cognitive health as we age. So you think your brain not as sharp as what it used to be, and you just tell yourself, I'm getting old. That will be a web, sh uh, web show for you. So thank you, for, uh, thank you, everyone, for being with us today, and have a good weekend, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Bradshaw. Good, thanks. And we should be posting this on the site so you can go through it and maybe show it to friends and that sort of thing in the, in the next 10 days to two weeks. Thank you. Goodbye.